Alright, so last week we started to look at the four G's. And that is the four ways to glorify God with being a peacemaker. Now, just for a recap, peacemaking response is how you deal with conflict. Are commanded by God, they're empowered by the gospel, they're directed toward finding just and mutual agreeable solutions to any and every type of conflict. Okay? We can deal with conflicts in these ways here. You can either overlook an offense, you can bring reconciliation, or you can have negotiation. We went through all of that as well. Now, we looked at the first two of glorifying God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, glorify God, motivated and guided by a deep desire to bring honor to God by revealing the reconciling love and power of Jesus Christ. That's why I picked this verse in 1 Timothy, because that verse gives you an idea of how powerful the gospel was in the life of Paul himself. Now, Raise your hand if you'd like to switch places with Paul and went through everything that he went through in his experience with preaching and teaching the Word of God. No. Anybody? No. no. How would you like it if God said about you, He's got to see all the things He's going to suffer for my name's sake? Okay? How would you like that to be the epitaph of your life? And yet Paul did it willingly. Paul was able to say that the love of Christ constraineth him. You know what that word constraineth means? It doesn't mean to hold back. It actually means to push forward, to compel, to move ahead. So this love that Paul had and felt and knew from Christ kept pushing him forward to deal with all the sufferings that he had to go through in his missionary work. So if Paul was able to do that, then we in our lives should be able to also have that same motivation. Motivated to glorify God by a deep desire to bring honor to Him by revealing the reconciling love and power of Jesus Christ. The second one is to, uh, this is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verse 5. You guys familiar with that, that verse? that before you try to change your brother or your sister, before you tell them their faults, yeah. you need to remove that big old log that's in your own eye before you try to remove the little splinter that's in their eye. That's really good advice. Very hard sometimes to do. Uh, if you were to ask anybody in ministry, what's the hardest thing for them to deal with? And that is to get people to see their true condition. You do Bible studies, you present sermons, and you present them for a reason. God gives you things to say. God, through His Holy Spirit, impresses you with what the church should hear. But it never fails that the people that you know really need to hear that either don't show up that day, or they're the ones that say, yeah, that's true. This person here needs to hear that. <laughs> so before you try to get the splinter out of your brother's eye, make sure that you're able to see that log, that beam, that is sticking out of your own eye. And how you do that is to face in, in conflict. You face up to your own contributions to a conflict before we focus on what others have done. As I said last week, I have very seldom, I can't even think of once, <coughs> seen just a one-sided conflict. Okay? <laughs> Usually you don't have conflict with yourself. Some people you see them sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time it's with at least one other person or a group of people, right? And there is personal responsibility on everybody's part. And so if you're able to actually look to see what your responsibility is, it will go a long way in bringing reconciliation 
or in the process of negotiation trying to bring in reconciliation. Does that make sense? Okay, so the third way of the four G's to glorify, glorify God is taken from Galatians 6 1, and that's what I'd like to look at this morning. Let's turn to Galatians. Galatians 6 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are what? You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness, Gentleness considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Do you like that passage? Paul wrote it in such a a beautiful way. It's very easy to understand, but if you would take this and use it, it works really well. Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, so there's some conditions that need to be met before you try to restore a brother or a sister who has fallen either into sin or temptation. What is that first condition? If you're going to be the one to go to them, you need to be spiritual yourself. Why is that? Any ideas? I like that. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Also, there's this whole issue of what is at the last part of this verse, and that is the falling into temptation yourself. Right? What kind of temptation do you think Paul was talking about here? That you would fall into the same sin that the person you're going to talk to right. is? That could be it, but I think more of it is falling into the temptation of self-righteousness. This is why you who are spiritual go and talk to them, because if you're not, then it will come across and probably be done in the spirit of self-righteousness. Yes, ma'am? On one side or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just yes. getting into a conflict yourself if you're not spiritual and being impartial to it. <laughs> That's very true. Another thing when it comes to falling into that same type of temptation, it, it, it depends on the situation. But if you have a friend in the church that you're close to, a brother or a sister, and they fall into a specific sin, that you know yourself that you also are weak to that sin, then before you go to that brother, you better make sure that you're spiritual and that your walk is strong and that your walk is right with the Lord before you try to correct them. Right? So, that's Galatians 6.1. What does it mean to gently restore them? Kindness. Where does kindness and gently restoring them fit into what the term we use as tough love? Can you reconcile those two? Yes. I don't have a problem with it. I see it very easily because, again, it depends on the situation. You can't beat them over the head. You can't beat them over the head, but there are some people that if you go to them kindly, speak gently to them, they don't hear you. They won't listen to you. A uh, perfect example of that is pretty much anybody that's uh, 14 years to about uh, 19 years. <laughs> right? Gently, you usually start off there, gently, right? And then after a while you realize, well, this isn't working. So sometimes you need tough love, right? If the person you're trying to restore continues to make the same mistake, now let's not use the word mistake, continues to act out the same sin over and over and over again, and your gentleness hasn't worked, then what is it time for? Yeah, tough, love. tough love. With gentleness, there also has to be personal responsibility, right? 
Nobody can be restored until they are ready and willing to accept their personal responsibility for what it is they're doing, right? One of the hardest forms of conflict resolution is conflict that has hurt somebody else and has hurt them deeply. And you're trying to bring restitution, you're trying to bring reconciliation, but the person that perpetrated this pain will not see, nor will they admit to the pain that they caused. You get this a lot within abusive families. Ma'am, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I was going to say that the trouble is with most of us is we don't really, um, we don't really take that responsibility and, and, and we, we always have this wonderful excuses as to, that I'm exempted from this. In fact, I have a very real case that happened in a very real church uh -huh. and, and, and this one was kind of somewhat funny. Um, and every person that I brought into was guilty, including me, of gossip within the church. And I saw this as a real problem. Mm -hmm. So everybody who was involved, I brought into a meeting to discuss the issue of gossip. And one of the ladies was extremely bad herself in regards to the gossip, and I think that's where we all kind of tend to get sucked into it. Uh -huh. and, and the discussion was about, but she took a great personal offense against it. She did not see that every person there was getting involved in this gossip. Uh -huh. And my intent was to stop everybody uh -huh. from getting sucked in. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and and, and I, I would tell you right now, I was just as guilty as of, of getting involved with in getting involved in it. Uh -huh. You know, you didn't want to get go there. I would tell you that that's one of the the strongest temptations that uh, Bible teachers, pastors, counselors have to deal with, and that is. Reading this book, okay, reading this book, when I first read a first couple of chapters of it, it's like, this is a great book, I need to preach on it. But the more I'm reading it, the more this thing keeps smacking me in the face. <laughs> to the point where it's, it's, there, it's, there's times when it's like, I don't want, I don't want to do this anymore. Let's, let's move on to a different subject. But... When your eyes are open to areas in your life that you have fallen short and God wants you to quit falling short, He wants you to actually be changed, sometimes that takes pain. And it takes a commitment to continue to look and continue to grow and face those areas in your life. See, as a pastor, it's easy to work on your problems because they're your problems. Okay, but when your problems are also my problems, and I'm having to counsel you with your problems knowing that I suffer from that same thing, and I deal with that same issue, where do I draw the line from being a hypocrite? You know what I'm saying? This is why the Bible says that not many of you should be teachers, because you're going to be judged with an even harsher judgment. Wow. You guys understand that, right? Wow. Okay? And anybody that's a teacher that knows that verse, realize just how how close that hits home. Yeah, but the teacher becomes the master. I think the, that teacher gets, you know, he tends to like his walk yes. with the word. I yes. mean, he gets closer to that's, it. That's a true teacher. And that's the difference between true, true teachers and false teachers, okay? This is why I continue to teach because it forces me to continue to study the Word, to know God's Word, and to change my life according to God's Word. You know what I'm saying? But you can see a plethora of false teachers on TV. 
who will teach one thing, but when you start hearing about their private lives, you realize that what they present in public and who they are in private are two different things. But, as she said, to be a teacher and really have a heart for God, it will continue to make you grow. Right? And you won't stay stagnant. You will continue to grow. Or you will be forced out of teaching. Because the spirits will move on your heart and convict you. Somebody had their hand up. Oh, I did. I was just thinking yes. of the Bible verse, and I can't remember where it is, but the, but the, the, the Lord cautions people that if they teach the wrong thing and they lead others to believe the wrong thing, they will be cursed. Yes. There will be a responsibility that they will have to answer to. Now listen, how many of you ever got sent to the principal's office when you were like in elementary school? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm right there with you. Now how many of you when you were in elementary school, they still actually beat you with paddles? So, you know, in elementary school, it was kind of a scary thing the first time you got sent to the principal's office knowing you were going to get spanked. Unless you got spanked at home and your mother hit you and your father hit you, like part of the principal did, but it's a different story. But anyway, I can remember the first time that I got sent to the principal's office. And through the years, we became really good friends. I was <laughs> <laughs> How about you? But you remember that anxiety that you felt? Because you are going to have to answer to somebody with authority, and that authority can cause you pain. Yeah. Now, how many of you have ever been arrested and had to uh, stand before a judge? Mm -hmm. Don't listen to them right there. Don't don't get shaken. Okay. Now that man has authority. You know what I'm saying, or woman, <laughs> they have authority. They can really change your life from the bad. They can send you to a very bad place. Anyway. So when you stand before them, you realize the kind of authority they have, uh, that anxiety that you have. Now listen, that's nothing compared to when you stand before God himself. Okay? Nothing. You would be wanting to stand before your principal or even a judge before you stood before God without Christ being your personal Savior. You guys understand that? Why do you think for 2,000 years pastors have been preaching about taking Christ as your personal Savior? Because Christ as your Savior is the only thing that keeps you from having to answer to God yourself. On that day of judgment, there's going to be two lines. One line that will have Christ there in that line, and the other line where those people are all by themselves. Both of us in both lines stand before God. The only difference is, if you're in the line with Christ, He's by your side. If you're not in the line with Christ, you're by yourself. Can you imagine standing before this God who emanates light? Who can speak an entire universe into being and you have to answer to Him? Wow. You thought your principal or the judge had power? Why do you think when Jesus comes again, those that have not accepted him will cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them? Why? Because they want to be hid from the face of the Lamb. So brothers and sisters, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible tells you that today is the day of salvation. Now is the time because you don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. Anyway. So, gently restore, when others fail to see their contributions to a conflict, we sometimes need to graciously show them their fault. If they refuse to respond appropriately, <coughs> Jesus calls us to involve the church, respected friends. As I said from the beginning, if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, the first thing you should do is go to your brother or sister. Now, this isn't just in the church. This is in your entire life. you got a problem with your boss at your work. Instead of talking to the other co-workers that you have, that you know are going to pat you on the back, go, yeah, I understand, but now you've just poisoned that environment. The boss walks in and wonders why everybody's giving him the evil eye. You should go to your boss. 
Is that an easy thing to do? No. Okay, because you don't know if your boss will fire you. Or make your life even more miserable than what it is now. But did Jesus put in a little parentheses that if your boss makes your life miserable, you don't have to go talk to him first? Right. Okay. What he says is if you have this problem, go talk to them. Why is he able to tell us to do that? What we fail to understand, and this is me, what I fail to understand is that I don't go into that alone. If I have to talk to my boss or I have to talk to a fellow church member, and it is a very uncomfortable situation, I don't do that by myself. Jesus said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So when I go into these situations, either he's with me, and the Holy Spirit gives me the words to say, or he's not. And if he's not, then that makes him a liar, and his words are true. Right? So if his word's true, and he cannot lie, then he will be with you in these situations. If you were Peter, and you denied your Lord three times, and you see him again, and you're so happy that you saw him again, he's alive, and he asked you the first time, do you love me? And you say, Lord, you know I love you. And uh, he asked you again, do you love me? You tell him again, reassure him again, and you realize I've denied him three times. He's asked me twice. Second time, again, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he asked you a third time, do you love me? And you understand what he's doing. Denied me three times. I'm asking you three times to love me. And after the third time, he doesn't take his arm and wrap it around you, but he actually tells you how you're going to die. Oh. This is going to be your future. They're going to hang you on a cross, just like they did me. And it's going to happen when you're old. And you're not going to be able to get out of that. Do you think that Jesus was with Peter all the days of his life? When it came time for Peter to look at that cross and go to it, do you think that he was by himself? No. Okay? So either you have faith and you realize and understand that God is with you, that Christ is with you through all these situations, and that he will give you the strength, that you don't go into these situations alone, then you can do it. And you can do whatever God calls you for. Okay? Sometimes in conflict, we need to graciously show them their fault. If they refuse to respond appropriately, then Jesus calls us to involve the church and the respected friends in the church, okay? Or respected friends within your community. The fourth way is to go and be reconciled. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Matthew 5, 24. Matthew 5, 24, Jesus is telling us that, can you turn this down a little bit? Let's look at verse 23 first. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, now what does that mean for us today? If What would we be doing if we're going to be bringing our gift to the altar? Giving ourselves. Coming to church, right? Worshiping. Okay, worshiping God. I like that. So, if you're in the act of worshiping God, and you remember that your brother has something against you, 